At the tail end of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, the Valvelt sub arc, it really became apparent that Kubo was in full on wish fulfillment mode, firing on all cylinders to bring us some truly titanic showdowns between Shinigami and Quincy in what was, in my opinion, an excellent setup for the ultimate final battle. I really loved the idea of having these last remaining Shinigami assaulting Yuhabark's brand new palace, the cornerstone of what would be his resurrected Quincy Empire, and meeting his ultimate warriors along the way. I thought it was an awesome idea, a great concept to essentially turn the Shinigami into the Ryoka, an inverse of the Soul Society arc effectively, and I thought it was just really neat. And honestly, the Schutzstoffel battles are excellent. Uniformly, they are all generally pretty good fights, uh, some of the best maybe in the entire series, because I think they include a lot of what people want from fights in Bleach. Now, are they perfect? No, but they are, in my opinion, mostly fitting final battles for the end game of Bleach. Now, of the Schutzstoffel fights, we've already made a video about Kisuke versus Askin, and so with the remaining options, I made a poll relatively recently to find out which fight you'd like me to talk about next. And the winner, by a considerable margin, was Kyoraku and Nanao versus Li Yabaro. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, and that's absolutely fine with me, because this is a really cool, really unique fight uh, that I think is unique in the way it is so polarising with the audience. And that's, of course, something we'll discuss as well later on. As always, though, there was very vocal support in the comments for another of these options, and that's another fight I really want to discuss. So let it be known that the next analysis after this one will be Mayuri and Nemu versus Pernod Pankajaz. Before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now for more Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up as well as it does help to support me and the channel. And if you really like what I do here and you want to take that support from me another step further, I do have a Patreon for the channel as well. We can get videos like this one early and you can support me there for as little as a dollar a month. To everyone who's coming up on screen right now who is a current patron of the channel, Channel. I just want to, as always, give you guys a massive shout out and say a huge thank you for helping me do what I love. I really appreciate it. So settle in, get a drink or something, because I know for a fact that this is going to be a long one. And the most obvious reason for that is this is an incredibly long battle. The fight between Kyoraku, Nanao and Lia, I think that's how you pronounce it, I'm not entirely sure, but Sternritter X, the X-Axis, is one of the longest unbroken fights in Bleach, and you know full well that's what we like here on the channel. A straight battle with no interruptions, or at least minimal interruptions. Uh, and this fight runs from chapter 644, right after the Mayuri vs. Pernida fight has ended all the way through to chapter 654, so unbroken and 10 chapters long, pipping the Mayuri and Pernida fight by a single chapter. And that in itself is a very long and unbroken battle as well, and so what you have here is truly one of the tentpole perennial battles in the entire series. This is one of the longest battles in all of Bleach. And I think personally, this is a fight Kubo was really invested in, really looking forward to getting to. It felt like he'd been building to this for the entire final arc. Kyoraku Shinsui, as you know, received some of the best character development this arc has to offer, and he is a truly shining example of what this arc did for some characters. And so because of that, it felt like we were always building to an ultimate moment for Kyoraku specifically. He just needed a fitting enemy. Of course, he has his skirmish against Robert Akutrone in the first invasion and a brief meeting with Ugram Hashwolf in the second invasion. So it felt like Kubo was always going to deliver on a big final battle for Kyoraku, the new captain commander, and this is it. In many ways, the fight feels like a trial by fire for our new Captain Commander. Yes, he's helmed the Gote 13 throughout basically this entire war, but in a 1v1 scenario, he hasn't really had to do too much yet since taking on that mantle of responsibility, and now here is his chance to shine. And this fight should have been an easy win for Kubo. That's what makes it so intriguing to me. 
You've got Kyoraku, who's an absolutely beloved character that only became more beloved as a result of the Thousand Year Blood War arc. You've got Lee Barrow, who was a character that people were interested in. I think his personality made him seem like maybe the most boring, in quotes, of the Schutzstoffel. But at the same time, he has a cool design and people were just really excited to see the supposedly all-powerful elite Quincy in action. And not only that, but there was a ton of hype going into this battle for really one reason and one reason alone. It seemed pretty obvious we were going to be getting Kyoraku's Bankai as soon as this fight began, which is something I probably mentioned back in my weekly chapter review. But Kubo had specifically mentioned Kyoraku in interviews prior to this arc coming out regarding whose Bankai we were going to see, so it just seemed like we were playing the waiting game before getting that big reveal. So, like I said, this fight should have been an easy win, but due to the way this fight ends, what I would call the final third of this fight, it has gone down in history as being a strangely controversial battle, a polarising battle among fans, and that's something I'm really looking forward to getting into. Now, this might be something of a hot take, but I feel, in my opinion, this is really Kyoraku's only quote-unquote proper fight in the series. Of course, he has his battle against Chad in the Soul Society arc, but really, he's just messing around and he barely has to lift a finger. And then there's his fight against Stark, which is obviously great and very popular, but it's incredibly broken up, to the point where two other people take over the battle for the second half, essentially, and Kyoraku only returned for one last chapter to administer, essentially, the killing blow. So really what you've got here is Kyoraku's proper fight from start to finish, and I think, again, maybe that is why there is such controversy towards the end here. It felt like this should have been our new Captain Commander's chance to really shine, and I think he does. I think he does shine in this battle in a way he never has before, but a lot of people were, I think, understandably slightly disappointed with the way things took a turn in this fight, so we'll get into that. So who is involved in this fight? Well, not many people, which is ironic considering it is the longest of the Schutzstoffel battles and you have, like, Gerard Valkyrie going up against the entire Gote 13, somehow that is shorter than this battle. Uh, I don't know what that really says, but this is an intimate fight. Um, as far as the Schutzstoffel battles go, this probably feels the most close-knit. You have essentially the first division, Kyoraku Shinsui and his vice-captain Nanao Issei, who up until now has never really been involved in a battle situation uh, whatsoever, to the point where she was completely absent from the fake Karakura Town arc. So this is really new ground for Nanao. Now, she has taken a slightly more active role alongside her captain in this final arc, you know, going up against Hashforth briefly, um, but again, not really doing that much. So this is kind of new ground for her. And then, of course, like I said, you've got Lee Barrow as well, a Sternritter who I think was just waiting to really show off what he could do and would turn out, I think, again, to be one of the more controversial elements of this fight because of what Kubo chose to do with this character. And I don't think anyone was expecting the outcome for Leia. Maybe that's a good thing, and maybe it isn't. But I think that is that is one of the more controversial aspects of this overall battle. So for some context around how and why this fight takes place, in my opinion, the setup uh, for this battle is great. It's really unique. It's a totally unique situation for Bleach, and I think it's just done handled really well. Um, so basically, like I said, the last few Shinigami, the last few surviving members of the upper echelon of the Gote are assaulting Varvelt, Yuhabark's new palace. They are running through his streets to try and reach this main central tower. Unfortunately for them, the Quincy have the upper hand. They have completely turned the Reiatsu in the air, the Reishi, they have made it totally dense and completely impossible to figure out where you're going to go, how to work out if there's an enemy nearby. This is a tactic they use in the second invasion as well. But it basically means is the bad guys have the home field advantage here. And so because of that, Lies is able to essentially hide on a rooftop and pick these guys off one by one with his sniper rifle. Really awesome, 
that Kubo gives this guy a sniper rifle and actually lets him use it in this kind of way. Uh, that might sound a bit ridiculous, but there have been a few examples in the past of someone having a really awesome and unique ability and just not getting the chance to really show it off in a way that is fitting. Lee picking off weaker characters as they run from afar is both terrifying, ominous, and just really cool, really a really great use of his unique weapon. We see him take out his Sagi, and then we get a small time skip, and when it returns to this fight, we discover that most of the vice captains are gone. It's difficult, really, to ascertain exactly who Lia has taken out, um, but we can kind of work it out based on who is not around anymore. So it seems to me like the characters that are now missing are Isane, Kione, Sentaro, and potentially Soifon, which is weird, but she just doesn't appear anymore. So it seems likely to me she was taken out. Whereas Amida actually appears very briefly, could be a mistake because you literally never see him again, but he appears very briefly against Gerard Valkyrie. And the way this fight begins is pure Kyoraku goodness. It's just fantastic. Um, he decides that they have to figure out where the shots are coming from because they're just losing people left, right and centre. And so he decides to make himself the target, stopping in his tracks, turning around and trying to catch sight of where these bullets are coming from. There's a great little panel, I don't know why, but I really like it showing Lie's Ryatsu kind of like pinging on top of the building, basically, you know, giving away where he is. It's like the glare on his sniper rifle, essentially, revealing his location. And Kyoraku, you know, he calls out, I found you, he spins around, but he suddenly gets popped in the chest, his eyes are bulging, he's horrified. He's taken a shot straight through the heart, similar in the way to Oetsu does in the Battle in the Royal Palace. And Lie is kind of disappointed, you know, he's like, I took you Shinigami for a slightly higher form of enemy um, that I'm used to, but this is apparently all it takes. All it takes is one idiot and the entire pack falls apart. And, you know, I'm disappointed in that. And suddenly he hears this faint, almost, it's like a song or like a chant. And he's like, you know, where's that coming from? When out of nowhere, Kyoraku is behind him, a super goofy look on his face that transitions, it flips like a switch to being incredibly sinister as he seemingly just tries to kill Lie in one hit. With this one stroke, it looks like he's going for Lie's head, which is very Kyoraku to dance around the fact that he's actually just trying to end the fight in a single blow. Um, and it kind of exposes that darkness beneath the surface, which again is a massive theme of Kyoraku's that's really amped up in this fight. And this is just such an awesome, a badass way to start this fight, to kick things off. I love that Kyoraku tries to take his head immediately and cuts off the end of his gun instead. There's a great panel of them staring each other down. And Kyoraku's like, wow, you know, nice dodge in the way that he does. I love the way he compliments his enemies as the battle goes on. But he says, nice dodge, but I've taken your gun. Next, I'll have your life. And... Like, that is so awesome. I mean, like, as far as starting lines go to fire off a fight, to kick off a fight, it doesn't get much better than that. Kyoraku is on excellent form here, just being a total badass, and I think it's a brilliant way to get the ball rolling. And of course, Nanao is there as well, and she arrives to assist Kyoraku after she appears behind him, keeping up with him using her Shunpo, which feels like a small reference to the Soul Society arc to me when she wasn't quite able to catch up with him beforehand. And he kind of sends her on her way, you know, to tell the rest of them that you won't be, that they, they won't be following on with them and then she needs to return to his side. And he says that she's starting to remind him a bit of Lisa, but Lee Ye ain't having it. He's like, you know, are we done with the chit chat? And I like that because Lee Ye is kind of the straight man to the more eccentric Kyoraku, which I think works really well. They play off each other really nicely here. And this is where Lee Ye's more stiff personality is mostly in check and I mean, he does kind of fly off the handle a little bit as the fight goes on, but because of the way he's kind of straight-laced here, uh, many people did see Lee as the boring Schutzstoffel member, myself included, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Askin, uh, and you can't really get much more disparity between their two personality types, but... I think the way Lia acts, the way he responds to things, works really well here and establishes a great dynamic uh, between these two characters as they couldn't really be 
more different. I absolutely love Kyoraku's tiny little mention of Stark here, mentioning the Urankar's number one guy. I didn't expect it, but it's just so cool to see Stark is still somewhere in his mind. He remembers this opponent, and I think it's a really nice uh, little reference for him to bring up. But more importantly, here we get our introduction to a brand new game for Kyoraku Shikai Daruma San Gakuronda, which is a variation on the game Red Light, Green Light. So the idea behind that game, of course, is that somebody is it. They kind of turn away from the rest of the players and the players have to creep up on them. When the person who's it turns around, the players have to freeze or else they're caught. So what happened here is Kyoraku initiated the game with Lia without him knowing, so making him it. So basically Lia was the one who was trying to catch the person who was coming up to him. What happens then, once this game is initiated, a pathway of Reiatsu is linked between the two players, and Kyoraku, being the one who's trying to approach Lia, begins to make his way up that path, which is how he was able to get to his location so quickly. This is really cool again, you know, it's also kind of broken. Kyoraku can just initiate these games without even being able to see his opponent, unless he initiated it literally the moment he caught sight of that flash, but, I mean... We don't even know if that's a literal flash or we're supposed to be, he's supposed to be sensing the person's presence. Either way, this is a pretty powerful ability and another one to add to Kyoraku's ever-growing repertoire. So the rules of this game are pretty simple. If the person who is it catches sight of the other player coming towards them, that other player dies. And of course, if they don't, then the other player gets a chance to kill them, which is what Kyoraku did. He appeared right behind Lia and almost took his head off. Of course, Lia is pretty powerful and was able to get out of the way pretty handily. Lee theorizes that what he shot initially was an illusion placed there by Kyoraku to be essentially a decoy, while the real Kyoraku ran towards him. And he basically says that as long as I can stay on top of the illusions, I'll be absolutely fine. In my opinion, all of this, and what comes a little bit later as well, constitutes the first third of this fight. And I'll be totally honest with you, the first third is probably my favourite section of this entire battle. It feels like a real classic Bleach fight. I love the banter back and forth between the two characters, the explaining of abilities, the choreography on show is excellent, and the whole scenario has a distinctly sinister feel to it. You know there's so many shadows on show here. Kyoraku looks completely evil at one point with this big grin on his face. Lia also looks similarly kind of scary, coated in darkness, one of his eyes visible. Um, I really like it. It's great. Both of these characters look totally like they are invested in this game to the death at this point, and I think it's a fantastically well-portrayed moment, and really kind of a precursor to the true darkness that will come later, but in my opinion, the way this fight is handled in the first third is my favourite part. And like I said, another reason why the beginning of this battle is so good, especially as a Kyoraku fan, but I think anyone who can really appreciate a good traditional Bleach fight, Kyoraku feels like he's on top form here. You know, Lie says at one point, you know, I think you put yourself at a disadvantage by telling me the rules, and how ridiculous is that? And Kyoraku just grins at him from underneath the rim of his hat, and he's like, well, it's only when we both know the rules that it can really be called a game. Kyoraku then feeds us a small piece of fairly interesting lore, saying that in battle, a, an experienced warrior sees via two different methods. The first one is using eyes, like everybody does. And the second one is something called Reikaku, where eventually this experienced warrior stops using their eyes to see, and will see using Reiatsu alone. A more experienced warrior, in particular, is more likely to abandon their eyesight for Reikaku as a battle gets going. And Kyoraku uses this to his advantage, knowing that Lee, being so very experienced, will be just using Reikaku. And he says that, you know, that wasn't actually an illusion of me that you shot previously. I actually hardened and solidified my own Reiatsu into my own image. You know, essentially a projecting a version of himself and just leaving it there for Lia to see. To shoot, you know, almost like a scarecrow or something like that. And Lia is like, you know, there's literally no way you can do that. You know, that's way too advanced and I would never fall for something Something like that, and Kyoraku gets a grand moment of kind of character development here, where he straightens up and he says, oh, but I think you would fall for it. 
You, you'll do well to know who it is you're fighting against. I am the captain commander of the Gote 13, Kyoraku Shun Sui, and he's there, you know, kind of just like looking down on his opponent, towering over him. You know they're both roughly the same size, they're essentially on the same plane of elevation, but the way Kubo draws this scene is to show Kyoraku looming over him. Uh, being, you know, I am the captain commander, Lear's horrified realisation of the calibre of enemy that he's up against and what Kyoraku is truly capable of is very satisfying to see. And it's a great moment for this character because, like I said, it's a trial by fire for Kyoraku, someone who was really thrown into the deep end as far as his promotion to the captain commander role went. And this is him really beginning to embrace it for the truly for the first time, I think. I mean, he's kind of thrown his weight around a little bit regarding the Central 46 and all that sort of thing. But it's really here where he talks down to a Sternritter, basically says, shut up, you know, I am the captain commander and I deserve respect. And I think that's awesome. I think that's so cool. It's a real renewed sense of confidence for this character who has done really well for the most part, I would say, in the shoes of the leader in this crazy war that Soul Society is in with essentially the fate of the universe hanging in the balance. So it's really nice when Kyoraku gets a moment to be able to talk himself up, deservedly so. And so as the fight begins in earnest, finally, we get some wonderful choreography here. Kyoraku tries to play that game again, reciting the chant, but Lie snaps off the broken barrel of his gun, potentially turning it into something slightly more close range, maybe? And he spins around to Kyoraku, planting the barrel of his gun in Kyoraku's chest, and he's like, you know, I know you're there, and he tries to blast him, firing this huge, massive star of light, which seemingly wipes Kyoraku out. It's lovely... Lovely choreography. I love seeing the angles that Kubo draws, Kyoraku dashing to the side, Liye swinging around. It's all very, very dramatic. And again, another reason why I love this kind of close quarters combat, this fast paced battle. It looks fantastic, but Kyoraku is one step ahead now, mixing games, which is completely insane. But all he's trying to do is trick Liye into looking the other way, so he is then free to step on Liye's shadow and activate Kage Oni. However, Lie realises this and he leaps into the air, kind of avoiding the shadow blade that comes bursting out of the ground. And as he twists around in the air, he fires his gun straight into the shadow as Kyoraku is leaping out of it. And it's just, it's just so cool. This whole section is awesome to see. I really hope they do it well in the anime because it's just great choreography on show here. And as Kyoraku seemingly evades that blast by leaping out of the shadow, he kind of says, you know, I've got nothing on you. This isn't very fair. You know, you seem to know all of my abilities. And as he says that, Kyoraku realizes that Lie's blast went straight through the shadow and connected with his foot. And Kyoraku is now missing a, a big chunk of his foot. Um, which would be the, the first of many holes that will be punched into the Captain Commander by the time this fight is done. I have to say, within this first third, this is exactly the kind of application of Katen Kyokotsu that I love to see. And it really feels like Kyoraku is so amped up here, and we're really getting to see him go all out. We're getting to see the best of him and his abilities. It's basically fantastic. I mean, what happens next is Lie tries to shoot Kyoraku again, and it seems like he struck him once more, only he's only hit another of Kyoraku's shadows. Not the real thing. Kyoraku appears behind him, and he's like, you know, you seem to really enjoy shooting those shadows, revealing yet another of Katen Kyokotsu's games of his Shikai being Kage Okuri. Uh, which is basically this idea where if you stare at someone's shadow for long enough, you're able to then project a version of yourself onto the battlefield, which is exactly what Kyoraku has done here. As Lie looks on struggling to really comprehend the situation, Kyoraku says, you know, children's games are completely unpredictable, and you have no idea when a child will suddenly grab your hand and whisk you into a game. And now that Lie's own hand has been snatched, they'll play until they die. And Kyoraku again, just these awesome one-liners for this fight kind of coming out of nowhere to close off these chapters. As a Kyoraku fan, the beginning of this fight is just brilliant to me, and I think the way Kubo depicts his character as being a sinister but playful captain is just so perfect, a perfect representation of his personality. The imagery on show is great, the application of games, Katen Kyokotsu getting to fully show off its full range. It's so, it's so much fun. 
And I love the way this fight begins. It's just awesome. And honestly, at this point in the battle, I have just nothing to complain about. I love how everything is being depicted. There's a nice little moment with Shinji here as well, uh, where he kind of talks about how it's, you know, a Captain Commander's duty to be left behind, to put his life on the line for his other comrades so that they can continue the fight. And that's, again, really nice because it means they're all putting their faith in Kyoraku, who is coming into his own as the Captain Commander. And the other Shinigami are seeing that and they're acknowledging it as well. And so that is just, again, it's really wonderful to see the dynamic of the Gotei 13 shifting. And you know Shinji even compares him to old man Yammer as well. So Kyoraku is really just coming into his own and filling the big shoes left by Yamamoto and is seemingly doing so in everyone else's eyes as well. Again, continuing with those bleach tropes that I love so much, Kyoraku has managed to get in really close to Lia and Lia says, you know, did you really think you would get the advantage by getting in this close to me? And Kyoraku says, well, yes, I, I already have. After all, I mean, you've been cut, haven't you? And I just love the drama, the, the cinematic way that the moment he says that, Lie's gun just snaps in half. Like, why didn't it do that before that? Well, because it's cooler for it to break when Kyoraku says that he's cut it. That's why. And I love that sort of thing. And Lie darks backwards, you know, to try and put some distance between himself and Kyoraku. Kyoraku's really feeling on top of this fight currently. Um, but we get a nice little moment here where Lie instantly creates a brand new gun. I thought this was really badass, to be honest, revealing that his gun's name is Diagram, and he just sort of swipes his hand across it to reveal a, a brand new design. What's really cool about this moment and this little nugget of information is that Lie actually explicitly says that this gun is his bow. So I really like that. I think it's really cool that he actually says that because a lot of Quincy who use slightly more unorthodox weapons don't ever say that they have a bow. Um, so I like this a lot. It basically means he's firing arrows all the time out of it, which is really badass. It also goes with the idea that Kubo said that he has modelled each of the Schutzstoffel members after an era of war. And Leah is supposed to be based on the idea of modern warfare, which again, I think works really well with him taking that very medieval idea of a bow and arrow and turning it into a freaking, you know, sniper rifle that can be transformed at will thanks to it being made of reishi. Unfortunately for Li Ye, despite him putting on this flashy showcase, he's forgotten the rules of the game and taken his eye off Kyoraku, allowing Kyoraku to appear immediately behind him again, very sinister, and attempts to slice him. Li Ye makes this crazy dodge, ducking downwards, going underneath, and as they're doing this small scuffle... Kyoraku suddenly says, oh, you know, did you, do you ever remember that feeling of when you were young and you might suddenly catch sight of your own shadow and it scared the living daylights out of you? And as he says this, Lie turns and looks up to the sky, horrified, as loads of clones, essentially, of Kyoraku come raining down from the sky. I mean, artistically, this has to be one of my favourite panels, pages, in the entire series. I mean, shadow clones are nothing new in fiction, but it just looks so awesome here, the way each individual Kyoraku is kind of bleeding out of the shadows themselves, which one's the real one, they're all wielding the massive scimitar blades of Katin Kyokotsu, and they're just raining down on Leah, who looks absolutely tiny in comparison, the perspective is awesome. And the, again, this is Katen Kyokotsu at its absolute finest. And of course, crucially, Kyoraku is clearly winning at this point in the battle. Despite Lie having scored a single hit on him, Kyoraku does seem to be absolutely dominating this fight. Katen Kyokotsu in Shikai is enough to completely run rings around and confuse Lie. And I think that's fair. You have to put yourself in Lee's shoes. There's so many different rules he has to pay attention to and all of these different games all seemingly happening at the same time. Now, this idea of fairness is a really interesting one because Kyoraku always brings up how his opponent needs to know the rules as well. But realistically, nobody knows them as well as Kyoraku. He's the one initiating the games. He knows when they're going to activate. He knows how they work much better than anyone else. And so he has a very clear advantage here as he brings down numerous blades into Lie's body and it looks like he's dealt him a serious blow. However, this is where things start to get weird, for lack of a better word, and we begin to leave behind that feeling of a traditional bleach battle and transition into something different. 
uncharted territory in many ways. And from here on out, really crazy stuff begins to ensue. And if you ask me, I would say this is where the second third of the fight begins. So after taking that pretty brutal attack from Kyoraku, we are suddenly treated to a surprise panel of Liye with both eyes wide open. And he reveals that when he opens both eyes, the true power of the X-axis is able to take hold, which in effect simply makes him totally intangible to most attacks. In the same way as his power, the X-axis allows his blasts to pass right through his enemy's body, in the same way once the true ability is activated his enemy's attacks will slip harmlessly through his body. And we actually see Kyoraku's own blade almost seemingly being forced from Liya's body. Now normally Liya has one eye closed with the X tattoo over it and he can only open it when he's in serious trouble in a fight. And we see uh, that this happens twice previously. The first one is when Kyoraku appears right behind him at the start of the battle using Daruma San Gakuronda, and the second time Liya's eye is forced open is when Kyoraku appears behind him again, this time using Kage Okuri. I've got to be honest, I really, really wish Kubo had actually drawn Liya's eyes open in those two shots, as it would really have just made the reader question what was going on, what's this all about, what does it mean, and it would have meant that this true, in quotes, ability of the x-axis wouldn't have felt like it came out of literally nowhere. It also just doesn't really make sense. He says that he's forced to have his eyes open when he's in danger, um, but he doesn't have them open in those two shots, and that's weird. It makes it feel like an afterthought. Whether it was or not, it's kind of impossible to say, but for consistency's sake and for just a little bit of in-battle foreshadowing, it would have been really nice if his eye had actually been open for those two panels. And we as readers would have been like, hey, his eye's open in that panel. What does that mean? You know, it's not open in the next panel. And that would have been a really cool little reveal to get a couple of chapters later. But Leah says that once he has had both eyes opened three times in a single fight, he is then allowed, allowed by whom I don't know, but allowed to continue that fight with them open for the rest of the battle, meaning that he will stay intangible until the fight is over. And he claims himself that the reason being for this limitation is that it wouldn't be fair to the sinners if he was allowed to fight like this from the get-go. Now, we actually get a small amount of exposition on Leah's character here, and the translations for this are weirdly all over the place, with some saying that he is the last Quincy to receive a shrift from Yuha Buck, and some saying he was the first Quincy to receive a shrift from Yuha Buck. Um, but what's basically the most important thing about this is that he considers himself to be Yuha Buck's masterpiece warrior, uh, the soldier that is closest to God himself. And I just have to say that the overall importance of this fight is, a re is really cool as well. It's just really awesome seeing the leader of the Shinigami taking on the Quincy who is revealed to be the leader of the Schutzstoffel. But Leah says that for him to be forced into this position where his eyes have been opened three times in a single battle by a lowly Shinigami, a sinner like this, is basically impossible to and, and shouldn't be allowed to happen. And we get a really nice... Um, ritual for the activation of his Volstendig here, where he just kind of opens that eye really widely, it begins to shine brightly, you see the light start to like whir around, it spins around like crazy, and then it basically forms this massive fleur-de-lis style star that like crashes into the ground. It looks really cool, and it's been a while since a Quincy has had a proper transformation ritual, so it's really awesome to see this, and again it lends credence to that idea that Leia is really a cut above most other Sternritter. While I think the eye-opening scenario is a bit gimmicky, and like I said, it should have been foreshadowed a little better in the fight itself, I do like, again, that bleach trope, that idea of a villain really getting backed into a corner and then activating their transformation. I just, I do love that. And it feels like, again, this fight so far, the pacing is perfect, I think. And really, again, I've still currently, outside of the slight weirdness around the two-eye thing, don't really have any issues with this fight thus far. The smoke begins to clear around uh, Liye's uh, holy form, and we finally get to see it, Ziliel, uh, Divine Judgment. This is one of those forms where I'm like, I don't know if I like it or if I don't like it. <laughs> I'm a bit, I'm a bit, 
weird on it. I think it does look okay, but there is that there is that strangeness to it, that kind of otherworldliness that makes it inherently just look a bit strange. Um, and strange is not necessarily a bad thing. It is a considerable departure, I think, from the kind of cold, calculated sniper that Li Ye was previously, which I think is maybe where the biggest uh, issues come from, because it really in no way resembles that form of his at all, outside of the fact that each of his wings that he has in this form, I guess, has, you know, barrel gun barrel holes on it or something like that. Maybe that's the only thing. That's about the only thing that is really comparable. Crucially, though, above all else where this design is concerned, there are plenty of things about it I like. I like the massive halo. I like the long white, the long white robe and the massive wings. I think he does look perfectly angelic here, and I think that's obviously what Kubo was going for. So, as far as this form is concerned, while Lee might now look like a bit of a weird banana or something, at the same time, I do like it, and I think it gives off that divine, godly vibe, which was probably the most important thing to Kubo when designing this form. Basically, I think this form looks better in some panels than others. In some panels, it does look really weird, especially with his, like, strange sort of stubby legs. But in others, I think it does give off that kind of terrifying angelic, otherworldly vibe. And I think that's the most important thing. So as far as I'm concerned, this Volston dig... I'm all right with it, and actually I really appreciate, like I said, the grandiose spectacle that was its activation, and the fact that it is a totally new transformation, where a lot of Quincy's just don't get that. But somehow, Kyoraku is suddenly immobilised, and Li Ye basically snipes him with three blasts from his wings, and you see the chapter ending with Kyoraku taking a serious hit, really for the first time since this fight began. He did get shot in the foot, but this is the first one where it really looks like he might actually be in trouble. I might be wrong about this, but I don't think it's ever explained how he is suddenly frozen to the spot, and I don't think it ever happens again, so that is kind of weird, but now the tides have turned and Kyoraku is on the back foot. So where most characters in this series have some kind of high-speed running ability, whether that's Shunpo, Hirenkyaku, Sonido, anything like that, um, Kubo reserves certain elements for truly godly characters, and one of those is actual teleportation. Aizen does it once he has transcended, and Lia can do it now in his Volstendig form. He, his body kind of like twists and disappears, and then reappears like his head appears and stuff in front of Kyoraku. It's all like suitably creepy and weird. I do think this um, holy form, I guess the main issue with it, and you kind of see it in the way this fight begins to play out is the fact that it does feel and look very different to his base form, which maybe some people are looking for that in a transformation, which makes total sense, but in terms of the tone and the way the fight is playing out, it does suddenly feel like Kyoraku is fighting a totally different person. But Kyoraku is, you know, really forced onto the back foot here, and he starts running away. He runs through some buildings, which is a small detail I like when Kubo does that. It gives some added depth to the fight. Um, it is kind of weird how this massive Quincy area is just apparently completely, just there's no population whatsoever. It's just Yu Hawak and the Schutzstoffel. Um, But I do like that. It, it does add a nice little detail. But Kyoraku basically just runs away. Um, Lee uh, appears in front of him at one point, and Kyoraku uses a Hado 78, I think Zangarin, which is a massive Kido blade, which makes sense to try, um, but Kyoraku would later discover that even Kido has no effect on Lee, and now he's totally intangible. And so, pushed to the very edge, Kyoraku, we see he has run right back to the start, where they began on the edge of one of the uh, of one of the pathways in Varvel, Kyoraku's gone right back to the beginning, led, them, led uh, the fight as far away from the rest of the Gote as he possibly can, and I'm going to say right now that I think the page where he activates his Barnkai, the build-up to the Barnkai activation, is kind of everything I ever wanted it to be, right down to the smallest bleach cliches that I love and, and, tr and cherish. In my opinion, my favourite Barnkai reveals are generally the cheesiest, you know, where the person is like, oh, you know, I'm right down to my, to my, I'm, I'm my last resort here, I'm at the end of my rope. Uh, I hope no one sees this, I hope no one gets caught up in this. You know, all of those tropes that are associated with Barnkai reveals, for instance, I think it's done perfectly here. It's done exactly how I wanted it to be. Kyoraku, you know, he's sat just like slumped against the wall. You can actually see the injuries. He has massive holes in his body where he was shot by Lee before. 
he's sweating and he says, you know, oh man, I, I knew he said he couldn't be hurt, but I didn't think he wouldn't be hurt by literally anything, including Kido. And he says, you know, I'm down to my last resort here. Raises both of his scimitars, holds them down in front of him like that. And he says, oh, Nanao Chan, I hope you're, you know, you're nowhere near. You get a small glimpse of Nanao sprinting back towards her captain, which again is really cool. And then he says, I'll see what's waiting for me on the other side, Bankai. And I just want to say as well, it's really, it is so clear that Kubo was taking his time with this fight. Like I said at the beginning of the video, it feels like he is really invested in this battle. And Kyoraku, you know, Kyoraku was definitely one of the most anticipated Bankai in the series. There's no doubt about it. But then so was Kisuke. And Kisuke's Bankai reveal is way more rushed, in my opinion, than, than Kyoraku. Kyoraku's given this lovely um, kind of monologue where he's, you know, at death's door, essentially, and he does his little pose, and all that is perfect for a Bankai reveal. But in my opinion, Kisuke's could have been so much better. I'm just comparing the two directly because they are about the same, I would say, in terms of fan anticipation. They happen at basically the same time. Um, but it just goes to show how two volumes from now, Kubo was really not only feeling really rough, but just running out of time as well. And so everything is so sped up all of a sudden. You can really see it in the presentation of these two reveals. Um, but Kyoraku, you know, finally finally activates his Bankai, and like I said as well, when we went into this fight, we were we were expecting it, or at least I was expecting it, you know, I think everyone was, and it was really great to get that payoff. So I think in terms of the actual Bankai activation, this is a top-tier reveal, and the curtain is lifted on the first stage of Kyoraku's play. But the Bankai itself is controversial, just like the kind of latter half of this fight, really, from, I guess, about now onwards, the fight is very divisive, very polarising, and I think a lot of fans were unhappy with what we got. I, I think it's important to remember, you only have to look at this fight, even if you don't jive with how it's necessarily written, it's very obvious that Kubo is trying his absolute best here to deliver something truly epic. And I think you see that in the narrative that unfolds as this fight goes on. This fight is is like on the level of an, of a of a uh, milestone Ichigo battle. It's it's just as long. It's got real massive character moments in it all the way through. And I think you know whatever you think of this fight from about this point onwards, um, I think it can't be understated how 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 I think much work Kubo was putting in here. And I think, for the most part, it, it does do the characters justice, but that's another issue we can confront a bit later on. Now, I have done a full video on Kyoraku's Bankai in the past, so we won't go too deep into the meticulous details here. But the first passive ability of his Bankai really sets the scene in a wonderful way, just draping this shroud of darkness over the area. But it hasn't turned to night. It's just an illusion that creates this deep dark feeling of dread this sense of having the chills like your hair is standing on end like you, you know someone's watching you or something like that combatants all over Varvelt feel this sinister this sinister feeling just lingering in the air it's really awesome again again that that lovely build-up that characters like Kisuke just don't get and they they should have done now I'm not saying that Kisuke has the same ability as Kyoraku to create this area of effect feeling in the air he doesn't but I think I mentioned this in the video I did about their battle I think it would have been awesome since Kisuke's Bankai is effectively a massive puppet well why couldn't we have seen her like actually putting herself together in like some kind of freaky way or something this is the sort of thing that makes a Bankai reveal really special, that, that scene setting. Really awesome to actually have a passive ability that just basically sets the scene. I love that, and it works really well, of course, with this being like a theatre play. But now that we've moved into the realm of Kyoraku's Bankai and away from his Shikai, it's Kubo symbolically telling us that the time for games is over. And now the real fight begins, essentially. And of course, Katen Kyokotsu, Shikai and Bankai in turn reflect the two different halves of Kyoraku's personality. But anyway, Kyoraku confronts Liya, who has transformed further... Uh, making his Volstendig look even weirder than it did before. The base of his massive robe kind of unravels, like spirals open, and these very strange hind legs kind of emerge that have, like, protrusions coming off the back of them that make him almost look like a centaur or something. Again, 
it is supposed to be weird. He Kubo is really going hard here on the biblical imagery, the fact that you know, you think of something Lovecraft, you know, something like that. We as mere mortals aren't supposed to be able to understand Lee's form here. That's exactly what Kubo's going for. And it does mean that on a conventional sense, on a superficial sense, Lee is going to look weird. I think, I don't, I don't think he looks cool, but I think there's more to it than looking cool. And I think that's equally important as well is, is how he looks thematically. And I think thematically it works perfectly. Um, but he doesn't look cool. But anyway, Kyoraku arrives, confronts him. It's really cool, that panel where Kyoraku steps out in front of Liya. There's like a tether almost attached to him, which is great. Um, and he basically says to Liya, you know, have you noticed the change in this in this world, in this atmosphere? You know, does it feel gloomy and full of despair? And Liya says, well, you know, someone's turned the lights out, but I don't think, I don't really feel any despair. And that's because a, a messenger of God feels no such thing as despair. As he leaps above Kyoraku, his massive wings uh, outstretch, lights appearing in each of the holes uh, in the wings to basically just blast Kyoraku with everything he's got. And a massive beam of light just wipes out a, a huge chunk of the platform they're on. And another thing I do like about these fights as well is they do, like, level the playing field. Like, the, the ground and the place they're fighting in is just completely annihilated. A huge chunk of the platform that they are on, like, collapses to the ground. It's just kind of funny that Kyoraku doesn't seem to care about that issue. Like, Hitsugaya has a real problem with the idea of these uh, these kind of buildings and, and platforms and bridges collapsing onto the Seireite far below, but Kyoraku just doesn't seem to care. Or maybe it's more that he can't do anything about it, so he's not bothered, I don't know. But either way, Liya basically says, you know, if we destroy the person using the Bankai, the Bankai itself will disappear at the same time, so I won't have to worry about it anymore, only to suddenly be blasted in the side by some kind of mystery attack. A huge chunk of Liya's body just kind of explodes, sending blood everywhere, and of course, being intangible, he's like, what the hell's going on? Suddenly another hit takes out his shoulder, and he's like completely shocked and terrified by this. And uh, Kyoraku emerges from the smoke unharmed and says, you know, the first stage of my Bankai is the sharing of wounds. So Act 1 takes hold, then Act 2 takes hold as Liya is basically covered in the plague. These boils and blood is running from every orifice on his face. It is pretty pretty gruesome, actually, but it's also really cool as well. And it's just this idea that Liya was kind of, a, you know, felt like sort of shamed by getting injured by Kyoraku's Bankai, so the second phase activates as well. And I love Kyoraku, again, just taking control during this, being like, now, no more talking between acts, as he just kind of continues his play, um, leaving Liya to just squirm. And I think it's a, it's a big testament to Kyoraku how strong he actually is, how busted this Bankai actually is. Liya is the leader of the Schutzstoffel, easily one of the strongest, not only Sternritter, but characters in the series. And he is still running around like a headless chicken when in the, uh, in the grip of Katen Kyokotsu Karamatsu Shinju. So because Liye regrets wounding Kyoraku because of the damage it's done to himself, he then is afflicted with the plague and then cast into the abyss, this massive illusory body of water, which again is just a great spectacle. Um, and it's just really cool to see them both under the water, Kyoraku saying, you know, now we've been cast into the deep end and we will stay here until one of us expires, one of our Reiatsus runs out. Again, Kyoraku ending the chapter with such a badass line, but... It's just the, the imagery here is so good. It's, of course, following this idea of this story about, you know, the lover's suicide, which we go into great detail in Kyoraku's Bankai's video. But you see Lee beating his wings, trying to get to the surface. There's a great panel of him underneath. You can see the light of the surface and he just can't reach it because, of course, the water's not really there. Um, it's, you know, an illusion. But his resolve vanishes the moment he touches that ice cold water and so he tries desperately to to escape only to find it's impossible and of course Katen herself arrives draping herself around Kyoraku's shoulders awesome moment really cool to see that filler design be made canon because it's a great design her, his Zanpakuto spirit looks fantastic and it's just so cool seeing her here and again this feels like a really fitting moment for the Captain Commander, I guess, seeing him again looking down on his enemy with his own Zanpakuto spirit over his shoulders, his Bankai active. It's just really cool, really awesome. And this whole scene, this whole sequence of chapters is just a big celebration of Kyoraku's character, which I guess makes the ending sting even more. But right now, 
we're enjoying it. And so Kyoraku activates the final act of his play, where basically he cuts the throat of Lee, takes off his entire head, his throat just engorges and it bursts and his head blows up. That panel, of course, where he slits his throat, cuts his windpipe is... is great as well just that awesome panel uh, image of Kuraku lunging forwards and the white rope around Leah's neck and this is what I mean but Leah just doesn't stand literally doesn't stand a chance the moment Kuraku activates his Bankai um, from that point on he's just along for the ride until he dies um, and it's it's I think it's, again, like I said, a testament to Kyoraku's power that he's able to damage the lead of the Schutzstoffel to such an incredible degree. Were it virtually any other character, the moment the headless Lia falls into the dark depths, the fight would be over. But of course, it's not going to be that easy. There's a nice moment between Kyoraku and Katen where they kind of talk to each other about, you know, how he is he using a Bankai every now and then is, is nice if he gets a chance to hang out with Katen uh, once in a while. And she's a really intriguing character as well when she talks about how he's injured, his kimono is damaged, and, you know, that's what he gets for wearing other women's clothes and all this sort of thing. Um, you know, you do get the sense that there might be some kind of a romantic relationship between these two characters, and it's a, it's a fascinating dynamic for Shinigami and Zan Pak To. But of course, as Kyoraku lies there and Katen says, you know, she's just glad he won, even after everything, even if they, if they quarrel and uh, squabble, she's just glad he's alive at the end of the day. But suddenly, of course, a holy beam of light bursts down, rains down from the sky and scores Kyoraku in the gut. And, you know, his eye just widens in horror. Katen looks down in horror. How can he possibly be getting attacked? But in the air, the headless Leah has risen again and he screams, you know, as his, as his head is reformed out of light, that there's no way a captain's Bankai could ever kill him. His face is contorted with, like, insanity as he screams at the top of his lungs, as, he, as his head is rebuilt, the very fibres are rebuilt with the light. It's a cool visual. It is a cool visual. Again, Lia's Volsendig does look kind of weird. There's something oddly two-dimensional looking to his Volsendig, I think, which I think is a result of it being made of light, so there's not much shading on it. But it does look a little bit strange. But this transformation is pretty wild, and the light builds and builds and builds and twists and creates like this massive dragon-like neck. You see it lean back, then it flings forwards. It has this huge neck as the transformation is underway. And in my opinion, this is where we enter Act 3 of the fight, the third, the final third, and probably where it goes off the rails the most. In my opinion, like I said at the start of the video, the first third is my favourite, and I think it gets progressively crazier as the fight goes on. It's already pretty unbelievable that this character just survived having their head destroyed um, by the Captain Commander's Bankai, of all things, um, and things only get weirder from here on out, and more controversial. So Kyoraku's long-awaited Bankai was rendered completely ineffective, essentially. And that's where the first, I would say, real issue arises in this battle. You have to ask the question, was there any need to keep the fight going beyond Lia getting his head destroyed? Well, maybe, because of what comes later, there is some valuable information here, but it does come at the cost of completely neutering Kyoraku's most powerful ability, something we've all been looking forward to for a very long time. So you have to ask yourself the question, how important is it to you that a Bankai succeeds? Or is it more important, or at least as important, that we just got, we got to see it? before the series was over. At least we know what Kyoraku's Bankai does now. Was it successful? No. And that's a, that is a big shame, especially after all the hype and all the build-up. And, and when you see, as well, compounding the issue, how Kubo does eventually dispatch of Lia, well, yes, it, it is a contentious subject, that's for sure. And as a Kyoraku fan myself, I'm really, I do find myself fence-sitting with this fight, I find, because I have things I really like about it, you know, particularly that first third, I think, is virtually flawless in terms of execution, but things like Kyoraku's Bankai failing, in my opinion, it's not the biggest issue in the world, and I think there are bigger problems with this fight than that, but Leah's transformation ends not quite as elaborate as his actual Volstendig activation, but we get to see what he looks like, and... I don't hate it. I actually think it looks pretty cool. 
More so than the last version of his Volstendig, it's very clear, overtly so, what Kubo is going for here. This is probably the most explicit, I would say, quote-unquote, religious iconography we've really had in the series up until this point, with his strangely human-esque face with the human ears and the very wavy, curly hair, yet the, the, the pronounced owl-like visage. There's definitely a weird, eldritch, angelic, almost cherubim look going on with Lia here. Make no mistake, any vestige of the original version of this character is completely gone at this point. He doesn't resemble himself in any way, shape or form, and that extends to his personality as well, which I think is an issue. Um, I'm not huge, I'm not a massive fan of that. I think that a character should retain some kind of their identity, no matter how many transformations they go. Um, even Eisen retained at least some something. His personality was at least somewhat the same by the time he reached his monstrous form, and that was like five forms deep. Here, this version of Lee is really just in no way any kind of resemblance to the original version, which was that cool, calm and collected sniper character who I think people enjoyed. And now we have this version of the character who is screeching about sinners and being God's divine emissary and talking about how everyone is so sinful. He's just a very different character all of a sudden. It's way more talkative. And it could be that the further into these forms he gets, the more unhinged he gets along the way, which I could totally see as well. But on a surface level, yeah, I don't hate this form. I mean, it's essentially his original Volstendig, but with the top half missing and now replaced with this strange new uh, dragon-like head. Um, but yeah, I don't hate it. He looks absolutely mad. Uh, you know, Kubo was going crazy with this design, but I don't think he was going off the rails crazy. I think Kubo very much knows what he's trying to do here with this character, which is to create that truly biblical looking figure. Again, like I mentioned, something we are not really supposed to understand. And, and I like it. I think I actually maybe prefer this form to his original Volstendig. So despite the fact that we've now gone extremely far from the man Lia used to be, I like the I like the fact that the core of the X-axis remains somewhat intact. Um, he grows these massive arms made of light. They look strange and segmented, and he lifts one up kind of very straight into the air like that, and it just fires a beam of extraordinarily straight light, which just cuts straight through uh, the battlefield, essentially severing basically this in this entire area. And at this point, Li Ye is doing colossal amounts of damage with basically every hit he does. Um, but again, I like the imagery on show here. There are some really, several really cool panels of him now in this dragon-like form, silhouetted against massive walls of flame that he has just created from his attacks. And I think it, it does give off this, 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 this kind of godly vibe that this fight has now gone up another notch. Um, in terms of the kind of power level on show here. I think it, it can't be overstated that this is now one of the most powerful beings we have ever seen in the series. And I guess in that in that sense, it didn't really matter if he stayed the same character in any sense of the word whatsoever. Kubo just needed somebody who could take Kyoraku and by extension the now to a place where they hadn't been before in terms of how how cornered they were, how weak they felt. Um, and, you know, Leah gets the job done in that sense. Um, but it, it's difficult to, I guess, I guess the hardest part is rationalising just how powerful this, this villain suddenly is in terms of what we've seen before in the series. This kind of power level, this ability to just regenerate from an obviously fatal wound had really mostly been um, reserved for characters like Aizen or even Ichigo at this point. And now suddenly Leah Barrow is doing these kind of attacks and the fight has just, it's, it's just gone a long way from that tightly knit, great choreography at the start of the battle, the quips back and forth, and I get it, fights evolve as the time goes on. And, you know, I'm not complaining. Like I said, I enjoy this form of Leia. I think it's cool, but I do think that this is where the fight begins to stumble. That being said, there's a really cool moment here for Kyoraku, where he is slumped up against a wall. Obviously, he's been blasted through the stomach now as well. And despite managing to evade that last beam of light from Leo, who is now just, like, scouring the area for Kyoraku, his face, like, contorting, his eyes, like, clicking open either side, 
it, you know, he has this really weird alien vibe to him. There are some elements where I'm a bit like, what is going on with this character design? When, when you know, it's funny because I look at, we're talking about Leah again, but he, sometimes he looks quite good. There are moments where he says things like, you know, oh, you know, your sins are, are so great. I like the whole owl thing. I think that all looks fine. But there are some moments where I wonder if Kubo took it too far and stretched this character way beyond the point of believability and just turned him into a bit of a joke. And it's like, I don't... It, it's, it goes beyond the point of me getting what he was going for, I guess. So, for example... Most of the time, this form looks okay, but once Kyoraku has evaded him and he starts trying to search him out, his head, like, contorts to, like, some massive, like, planetoid donut thing, and his eyes are, like, scoping out the area, and then he, he, he brings his head back in again, and it's all wobbly and weird, like jelly, and, and then I'm just like, what is going on here? Uh, <laughs> and, it, and it gets even worse as well later on, but... Kyoraku is, you know, resigned to death, essentially, at this point. He's collapsed against this wall. He's bleeding out. There's blood just, like, around his legs, around his, his lap and his feet. And Katen comforts him. And, you know, she says, you tried your hardest, but this is an enemy that the Karamatsu Shinju cannot kill. I've exhausted all my options here. And, she, you know, she's like, we should just go. And she says to him, you can, you know, sleep now, slip away, and I will, I will take you away. And I, when I read this the first time, I thought she meant die. You know, I thought she meant, you know, just, just accept death and we'll go together. You know, I, I will take you away into a sleep and we'll just both pass away. I'm not entirely sure. I, I would prefer it if that's what she meant, because I think that's really cool. And it harks back to what she said when she first arrived, when she said, you know, I am your blade. And you are my master, but we are one. And I swore I'd be by your side until you died. Um, and this is that moment. And it feels like that this is the end for the Captain Commander. And he looks so beaten and downtrodden, these bags under his eyes. But it, she could simply be saying that she will literally whisk him away um, and get them out, both out of there, perhaps maybe using something like Kageoni or something along those lines. But it's a it's a it's a powerful moment. And it, you know, Kyoraku is such a jovial character most of the time. He is a he's one of these captains who is like always in control. Even when he's not, but he's even when he's not in control, he's still cracking wise. You know, when he gets his eye shot out by Robert, he has a grin on his face and he's like, he's sweating, but he's making a smart ass remark about how, okay, maybe this isn't looking quite as good as I thought. He's not, not saying anything. You know, he's not saying a word. He's just like, his head is lolling. He's panting heavily. Katen is like talking about, and it's, it's, it's pretty heavy. And this is the kind of character moment that I relish from a fight like this, where the stakes feel real. You know, a bleach fight doesn't tend to reach this point. And that's the benefit, I guess, of having so many chapters dedicated to this battle. You've now reached a point where Kyoraku is cowering behind a massive tower. There's, the, there's a torrent of fire surrounding it because Lie is just raising the area to the ground to try and find him. And he begins to close his eyes. And it is this moment that makes me think he's going to die. It's... it's, it's framed in such a way that it looks like he is going to disappear as he uh, he closes his eyes and then suddenly he hears this voice saying you know you know wake up shinsui san wake up and then suddenly it's now in front of him in the, in the present day shaking him like captain you know you have to wake up you have to get up and this is where it gets controversial Nanao's re-entry into the battle is where people have a major problem with this fight, and the fight goes from being what should have been, we said at the start of the video, a guaranteed win for Kubo, to something that I think was a bit of a gamble. Um, and my own thoughts and feelings on the essentially ending of this fight is something we'll discuss as well. So Nanao wakes up Kyoraku, and they're in this totally desperate moment, and suddenly Lia appears behind her, having heard her shouting at Kyoraku. He, again, he, he does look pretty ominous here, totally covered in shadow, except for his glowing, piercing eyes. Going on and on again about Sin, which again, sort of feels like it comes out of nowhere for this character a bit, um, but... Re kind of reinvigorated by the fact that Nanao is now in danger, Kyoraku uses his Zanpakuto to disappear into the Shadow World, which is really cool. I'm not going to lie, it's awesome that we actually get to see Kyoraku and Nanao hanging out in the shadows. I think that is so cool. And the next phase of this battle is really weird. Like, it's unlike anything we've ever seen before. 
it's highly cinematic, I think, and I actually really like the way it kind of starts in media res and then begins again with a flashback that takes us back prior to them again. It, basically, the timeline for this next set of chapters is a bit all over the place in the way events happen, but I think it works really cinematically. Kyoraku takes the now into the shadows and they get a, a small breather and a chance to talk to one another about the current situation and, and uh, Kyoraku kind of says, oh, okay, so you know about yours on Park Toe, you know everything. And she says, yeah, I, I literally, I, I know everything. I know about the promise you made to my mother. All of this, of course, is total news to us. We're all finding out brand new information here, which, you know, is part of the problem. I, I also want to say that I think there is an annoying fake out here as well, which is done purely for cliffhanger purposes, where basically Kyoraku says, all right, I'll give you your Zanpak toe, Kyokotsu. And you see the Zanpak toe spirit of Kyokotsu standing next to uh, Nanao, and it's like a, what moment? It's like a, Nanao Zanpak toe has been Kyokotsu all along? Except that's not it at all. It's a total misdirect that is done, I think, just for the purposes of a cliffhanger. In the next chapter, Nanao is like, wait, Kyokotsu is my Zanpak toe? And Kyoraku sort of says, yes, but no. And then he reveals that Kyokotsu is actually hiding Nanao's true Zanpak toe. At this point, Leah is just getting weirder and weirder as well as he tries to find where they are. His head is doing that thing where it's like stretching out like some disc to try and locate them. And he realizes that they are hiding in his shadow. And this is what I mean when I say that the sequence of events is, is handled uh, weirdly here, but I like it. I think it is quite cinematic, like I said. He summons a massive orb of light to basically rid the entire battlefield of shadows, but in doing so, he creates a small shadow on the tip of his beak, and from it, Nanao, like, emerges. And I think that panel is cool as hell, not gonna lie. I don't know why, I just think it's really awesome the way she, like, jumps out of the shadow and Leah is like, whoa, like, you could even come out of a shadow that big. Um, but I just think it's great, and you can see her already holding something in her hand, which I, th I think, again, is a nice detail. It's wrapped in, in, a, in like, a cloth, so we don't know exactly what it is yet. That's what I mean by it kind of starting in the middle, and then we go back to their discussion in the Shadow World. Basically, we get this exposition about Kyoraku, Nanao, her family, his family, how their families intermingle, intertwine, how their pasts connect. I'm tempted to do a, whole, a video on this in the future, I think, because there's a lot to talk about here. Um, but basically, the entire thing is talking, is, is justification for a magical blade that is perfect for bringing down Leah. So essentially, Kyoraku Zanpakuto used to be just Katen, but Kyokotsu was created to hide the secret ceremonial blade of the Issei family. This all stems from a legend called the Issei Curse. Now, the Issei clan is a women-only clan. There are no men born into this family whatsoever. And every man that married into the Issei clan would eventually die of a mysterious curse believed to be associated with this mystical blade. In an attempt to escape and subvert the curse, Nanao's mother instead married outside the family, finding a, a man and marrying into their family instead. But unfortunately, the curse still seemed to activate and that man eventually died. And apparently it's basically custom for, you know, uh, widows in that in that um, kind of era to be exiled and shunned from the family they married into. So Nanao's mother was dragged back into the Issei family. And that man that she married, that outside family she joined, was the Shun Sui family. Shun Sui being a lesser noble family as well. And so that's how they are kind of interlinked in that way. The man she married was Kyoraku's older brother. So now that Nanao's mother is Kyoraku's sister-in-law, she returns to the Issei family, obviously completely disheartened, but she tells Kyoraku to hide the Issei blade to protect her daughter, who of course will eventually grow up and presumably marry at some point, and the curse will afflict her as well. So she wants Kyoraku to take this burden and hide it away forevermore so that Nanao can never be affected by it. And it's a little bit weird here because Kyoraku mentions that he gave the sword to Kyokotsu because she was fond of hide and seek, except I thought Kyokotsu was only created to hide this sword, so that's a little bit weird. We get a big moment for Kyoraku and Nanao's relationship here, 
their relationship has kind of been building a little bit, I would say. I don't think it changes that much throughout the series. Nanao has always kind of been irritated by Kyoraku's antics, but ever since the Soul Society arc has very clearly had great respect and admiration for this character, and, and their relationship goes both ways as well. Um, but I think it really comes to the forefront here, and Kyoraku, maybe more than anything, stops protecting Nanao, like he has always done. He protects her from Yamamoto in the Soul Society arc, and now he finally lets her take hold of her own destiny. She, he says that he doesn't want to give her this blade, even though it's the only thing that can currently save them, um, because he doesn't want her to fall victim to the curse, perhaps out of some worry for himself, if he might die being the man currently associated with Nanao. But Nanao says she's not worried about the curse, she chooses to accept the blade herself, and she thinks that Kyoraku, being the man he is, the man she admires so much, would simply brush off a curse as being something ridiculous and superstitious. And Kyoraku says, you know, he relents and he smiles and he says, all right, with this blade, I'm sure you'll be able to. And it cuts back to that present day where Nanao has leapt out of Lee Barrow's beak and she's preparing to do battle with him. What's the big deal with this blade, though? Why is the blade so important? How is this blade going to help against someone who's totally intangible? Lia is a being of pure light at this point and seemingly cannot be stopped. If he can't be destroyed by having his head destroyed by Kyoraku's Bankai, then nothing can. Except this blade, this ceremonial Issei sword, is exactly what they need to get out of this situation. It is basically the only thing in the Bleach universe that could have saved them in this moment, and it just so happens to be hiding in Kyokotsu's face. And the ceremonial blade is probably the biggest aspect to the overall controversy of how this fight ends. There's no denying, there is no denying that this sword is a deus ex machina. It's a term I think people are a bit sick of being bandied around, and it does apply to a few things in Bleach. There's frankly no way a weekly serialization like this could run for as long as it did without needing some kind of author injection like this every now and then. And it does feel to me like Kubo got to the point where he was like, I don't know how to realistically get rid of this bad guy. So he invents this ceremonial blade with the ability to reflect God's holy light. Basically, this sword it has no edge, it cannot cut things, but what it does do is reflect and disperse the light and therefore ergo the power of God himself. And so Nanao leaps out of Liebaro and Kyoraku explains that the Issei family has no Zanpakuto. Anyone in this family just cannot manifest a Zanpakuto of their own, although this early vice captain spread would maybe suggest differently. Um, but basically, they pass down instead this cere ceremonial blade, which is supposed to dispel God's power, and that blade is Shinken Hakyoken. Really awesome and dynamic page where Nanao releases, basically removes the cloth and reveals the blade itself. And it is cool. It looks awesome. The sword is very unique. And it is really cool from a lore perspective to see one of these ceremonial blades being used in action. There's just no denying that it's unbelievably convenient that this is exactly what they need at this time and they've exhausted all other options and by you know in terms of all intents and purposes Lie Barrow cannot be killed but he can be defeated by this magical blade that Nanao's family happens to have and not only does Nanao's family happen to have it Kyoraku happens to have it on him at this very moment due to the circumstances surrounding their past yes it was a lot to it was a lot to confront back when this chapter first came out and it was especially grating that Kubo had essentially sacrificed Kyoraku's Bankai for this. Now what do we get out of this in return? Well we do get some really nice flashbacks that come up a little bit later regarding Kyoraku and Nanao their history and ultimately it is entirely down to you what your where your enjoyment is in this fight. How you feel about the ending is going to be a, a personal decision on your part. But as Lia kind of squints at this blade, we see that it is reflecting his light brightly back at him. And so 
revealing that when he says, oh, it's like blinding me, Nanao realises that the blade will work against him. Um, and she lunges at him and basically prepares to fight. And again, I think another thing people just weren't expecting is no, disre no disrespect to Nanao, but she'd never been really in a battle scenario before this one. So for her to take on the most monstrous version of Lee at the end of this battle after Kyoraku had nearly died really stretched at least my suspension of disbelief a little bit. It seemed like she'd been handed this god sword out of nowhere and was now about to clean up one of the most unfathomably powerful enemies the series had ever seen. But like I said, we get some nice history for these characters, so there is a trade-off here, and clearly Kubo really wanted to show this flashback. And it seems like flashbacks were supposed to be a big part of the Schutzstoffel battles. Mayuri and Nemu have a really nice origin flashback as well, and now Kyoraku and Nanao are getting them too. Again, heralding kind of how rushed the next two fights were, and that there were no flashbacks whatsoever, when clearly I think Kubo wanted to have flashbacks play a major role in each of these fights. And this is a, it's a cool one. It's really cool seeing the now struggling to bond with an Asauchi of her own and instead deciding to join the Kido Corps. But instead, her request is denied and she's picked up strangely by the 8th Division and she discerns that Kyoraku is the man who her mother confided in before dying. Um, and it's... It's really cool, and I love the fact that we get to see Kyoraku in, like, almost every stage of his life. Like, he's a little kid way earlier on in the flashback of Yamamoto. We see, like, a sort of teenager version of Kyoraku here. Really, really hitting home, I think, this idea that Kubo just loved this character. Like, absolutely loved this character. Which maybe runs slightly parallel to the idea that he didn't give him the win. Although I think what you're supposed to take away from the end of this battle is that the win belongs to both of them. But again, you know, it's nice seeing Kyoraku as a teenager conversing with his older brother, who is, of course, marrying Nanao's uh, mother. Um, and as these two people die, these two lovers die, they're always giving Kyoraku something to look after, whether it's the hairpins, um, whether it's Shinken Hakyoken itself, and Kyoraku always feels the burden, the weight of what these people hand him just before they die. Why does he always have to shoulder it? This guy who has always felt like he has very little in the way of responsibility actually literally bears the weight of the world on his shoulders in the form of Nanao's mother's kimono and also the hairpins that he wears. He literally bears it on his back. And so that is really cool to see it. I will never say no to more flashbacks, to more in-depth exploration of characters like this is exactly what I want to see. And if I have to, if I have to have a pretty silly ending to a fight to get it, I'll probably take it. But anyway, Nanao lunges at Lie. Lie kind of goes to block the sword, but his arm is instantly severed. Light bursts out of his arm as it is cut in half, striking Nanao, hitting her on the foot and sending her flying. And Lie kind of says, well, I'm, I'm surprised that you could attack me and actually hurt me with that. Um, you know, that blade is actually dangerous. Um, and it's funny as well because she says, you know, well, it's reflecting God's light. And he's like, well, I don't know what that means, but I like you calling me God. I think that's I quite like that. But now, again, we get some nice character work for her here. She goes flying backwards and she's like terrified. She's managed to land one hit on him, but doing so injured her as well. She's got a huge chunk of her ankle missing. Blood is going everywhere. And she says, like, this is really painful. You know, holding a sword is like terrifying and I'm sweating and I can barely move and I'm in so much pain just from this one injury. A lot of people didn't like this characterization. As far as I'm concerned, it makes total sense. And now is a full on bookworm. She's, you know, the admin officer. She's the Shinigami who's supposed to be in the library, supposed to be behind a desk. And for her to be out on the front lines like this against such a terrifying foe is a big step forward for her. And her really... Much as it's a trial by fire for Kyoraku as the new captain commander, it's a trial by fire for Nanao as the new first squad vice captain. But Lie decides that he has had enough of this. He thinks that blade is actually kind of dangerous. So he again summons a massive orb of light, basically being like, you should have killed me with that. I will never let my guard down again. Typical villain speech. And they basically summons this huge orb of light, which creates a massive shadow behind Nanao. She's like terrified. She's probably not going to be able to have the courage to lift the blade um, and stop Lie's final attack. But as the shadow stretches out behind her, inside the shadow world, we see Kyoraku sitting alone, lamenting 
the fact that he always has to take on everyone else's burdens, lamenting the fact that Nanel readily accepted the curse and that he is still just sitting here in the darkness. And I think it's a visual representation of this idea of moving on, moving on from the past, letting that curse die in the past where it was. It doesn't have to end that way, basically. And Kyoraku takes that and takes his own destiny into his own hands, much as Nanao did earlier. And he steps up, rising out of the shadows behind Nanao, and he helps steady her and prepare her and calm her for the final assault. Realising Kyoraku has returned to the battle, Lie readies his ultimate attack, which the Orb of Light transforms into a massive angel's trumpet called Trompet. And Lil basically prepares to blow the trumpet and utterly obliterate everything in front of him. The ending of this fight is so... it's weird, and I think your enjoyment will vary based on how you feel about Shinken Hakyoken. It is this god sword, this god-defying blade, which was exactly what they needed, as we've said, and it came to them as though it were handed to them by the author himself, which is the definition of a deus ex machina. But I think I can look past the sword. Thematically, I like the development we get for Kyoraku and Nanao. I like this situation that they are put into, and I think, again, this whole fight looks and feels so cinematic, right to the very end. I do think this very final moment is maybe a tad anticlimactic, um, and I think we just maybe should have had a bit more for this final exchange of, of attacks, but basically, Kyoraku appears behind her now, he takes her hand, he says, you know, ready yourself, I'm here behind you always, he holds the blade as well. Nanao feels relief rushing over her, she realises that she can face this guy down now that Kyoraku is with her. The two of them, this is what I mean when I think Kyura you're supposed to think that the battle, the win belongs to both of them, is that together they can beat Liya, but on their own they would have both lost in separate circumstances. You know, I don't think... Obviously, Kyoraku was basically about to die on that tower, and I don't think Nanao would have been able to steady herself enough to get the courage to deflect Trompette. But they ready themselves, and Liet fires Trompette, and he basically just blows this massive horn, and it... I, again, I like that. It's very angelic. I think that's really cool ability, and it just completely washes over the battlefield, completely devastating the entire area that they are on, except for the small platform that Kyoraku and Nanao are on, because she is wielding the blade Shinken Hakyoken in front of her face, and Trompette, a bit of Trompette anyway, obviously not all of it, but a bit of Trompette goes flying back towards Lia and wipes out half of his entire body. Uh, Nanao does look pretty cool, undeniably wielding the blade like that steely determination in her eyes, but I do think it's a little anticlimactic. It's just kind of like over too quick, I think. Um, I think it would have been cool if there was a bit of maybe more inner monologue and we see Trompette coming towards them. Nanao maybe swings the sword to bring it up into her in front of her face. I don't know. I just think it, it happens a little fast, maybe. Um, but Lee kind of like feels his face is gone and his body starts to crack and he says, oh, you know, you did say that you could reflect my power. And he says, you know dispersing the power of God like this is very sinful, as he breaks into a thousand feathers. And all of the feathers rain down on Kyoraku and Nanao for what I think makes a fairly satisfying end to the fight. Except it's not over. Why is it not over? <laughs> I don't know what... This is where I, I'm starting to more and more think I don't know what Kubo was thinking with the end of this battle. Should Liya have died when he was decapitated by Kyoraku's Bankai? Probably, yeah. Should Liya have died when his power was reflected back at him by the only sword that could do that? Yes, absolutely. Instead, the disbursement of God's power is taken very literally, and Liya is hit by this attack, and I guess it's, it's his own attack infused with the ability of Shinken Hakyoken somehow. And when it says it disperses his power, it literally does exactly that. His body is turned into like a rainfall of energy, which just completely just falls down past Varvelt and back into the Seireite. And 
We're going to carry on with this in a minute, but I want to discuss briefly how I think this could have been handled better, this, this ending of this fight. So basically, to sum it all up, Kyoraku's about to die, Nanao arrives back on the battlefield, and she has the only Zanpakuto in the world that can currently stop Liye. And she brings it out, deflects his attack, and he is defeated. And it's not hard to see why people were let down by that. We had to sacrifice Kyoraku's long-awaited Bankai to get this moment, but I do think it's a trade-off for the interesting character work and the interesting flashbacks as well. And I don't hate the ending, I do think it's a bit anticlimactic, and I do think it could have been handled a little better. But regarding Shinken Hakyoken itself, this could have all been fixed. Imagine if... Prior to Varvelt, say we're down in the in the Seireite during the second invasion, the Soul King is killed, maybe, or this or or it's the moment where Kyoraku says, you know, the royal palace is in danger. Actually, that is the perfect moment. Kyoraku's looking out across the battlefield, all of the lights of Auschwalen are raining down, and he says it's now the royal palace that needs our help. From that point, he could have turned to Nanao and Okikiba and told them a bit about the past of the Soul King and why it's so important to protect him. Told them about the heads of the noble houses and how they pulled apart the Soul King's body. And he could have said something like, how do you, how on earth, though, could they have possibly dispersed the power of a being like Rayo? Well, they had a mystical sword. Uh, called the Shinken Hakyoken, which is a ceremonial blade designed to break apart the power of God. And then he could have had like a shifty look on his face and been like, but rumour says it's been lost. And, you know, you can have a panel on Nanao's face when he says it. That is how you do foreshadowing. Like, that's literally just something I've just come up with right now. It's not perfect, but that's how you do foreshadowing. And at the same time, you get a much needed backstory for the Soul King. But basically, from this point on, people will always be thinking... Oh yeah, Kyoraku talked about some god sword, and oh yeah, he looked at Nanao when he said that. So when Liya transforms into this unkillable being of godly light, where is your mind going to go? Oh yeah, back to that conversation Kyoraku had with Nanao. Maybe she's going to actually do something, because... Oh, oh there she is, and she, Oh, Shinken Hakyoken, that's exactly what he was talking about. And I just think people would have been alright with it if something akin to that had happened. So that is kind of how I guess I would have done it if I had the chance to do it, but it's just... Uh, a fleeting thought. Anyway, the fight is, for all intents and purposes, finally over. And this is a very long video, but it's a very long fight. Like I said, it's the, one of the longest unbroken battles in the entire series. Lord help me if we eventually do Ichigo versus Ulkiora. But I just think Kubo, I don't know, if he just didn't know how to end it or where to end it. Leah's body rains down on the Seireite, literally. And he rises up as multiple weird little flamingo bird things, taking this transformation to the extreme, past the point of absurdity to just complete disbelief. And I, I will be honest, like, the patience that I had has gone at this point. I hate this form. I think it just looks really silly. I think it's... it. Lia is completely dead. It, his character is just gone at this point. Replaced with some squawking bird that just, like, goes on and on, prattles on and on and on about, like, losing his halo. And, like, I kind of like that. I like that he has literally lost his divine powers. So can he even return to human form again? I don't know. I, I think maybe he's, like, kind of screwed at this point. Um, but he says that he has enough power still to wreck soul society, but, of course, he is attacked by Izaru Kira, and it feels like the only reason that this epilogue exists is to reintroduce Kira into the story for this one chapter. Don't get me wrong, I still think there is, is good symbolism on display here. Leah has literally fallen from heaven and crashed onto, onto earth below, having lost his divine powers, and he, so, he himself is like, I've lost my Heilig Schlein and my divine powers and I've fallen from heaven. It's as though I myself have sinned. And it's like, well, yeah, you're the bad guy. You know, and I, and I like that. I think that's really cool. It's like his own hubris has caught up to him and he's been hoisted down to earth. And I think it's fitting for a character so, so pompous, essentially, as Leah. I just think he looks absolutely ridiculous at this point. Like, I was fine with his Volsten dig. I actually kind of liked his second cherubim form. But this I just cannot get behind, because I think it does, it just completely removes any threat or any serious nature that this character had. And I don't know what Kubo was thinking, apart from making an enemy weak enough that Kira could mop him up. 
And so it, it's, it's a shame for me that the fight has to end this way. In many ways, it does feel like an epilogue. It is still attached to the battle, so it's part of it, but it does feel like an epilogue. The actual fight has already ended up in Valvelk. Kyoraku kind of collapses to the floor, but they're both alive. And now rushes over to him and he says, you know, maybe we'll catch up to the others once I've had a bit of a rest. And, you know, so comes to an end. One of, one of definitely the biggest tent pole battles in the entire series. I mean, this fight is huge. I mean, I don't think anyone expected this from this battle when it began. And I think in many respects, Kubo absolutely delivers here. I, I really think he does. I think he's trying so hard to deliver a great fight that at the same time covers major lore points for these characters. And I think the major hiccup is that he didn't know how to get rid of Leia without adequate foreshadowing. Um, and, and so for me, you know, it's that question of what do I feel about this controversial Deus Ex Machina ending? Do I hate it? My honest answer is no, because I don't, I don't, I can't hate something that gives us so much lore and so much character development. That's the price we have to pay to get these flashbacks. And I like the flashbacks. And I do think that the ending sequence is pretty cool as well. I, I like it. What I don't like is the silly bit at the end with the flamingo birds, which I think is completely unnecessary. I think Kubo was already pushing it with what was necessary, having Lia survive the Bankai. And then he just goes too far here. That's my main issue. But as for the fight itself, I I think it's pretty good. I do think it's pretty good. I think it's I think it's meant to be very popular in Japan. I think it was more polarizing here in the West, I believe. And I think a lot of the themes of Kyoraku's Bankai really swell in Japan. They, they you know they land a lot better. The same goes for the ever so ever so thin, slither thin foreshadowing, if you can even call it that, around the name Issei, the Issei clan. You know, it's uh, you know, it's literally like saying she is a family from the church or a family of priests, you know, people who deal with the divine. Yeah, fine, but I think there should have been more. I think there should have been actual foreshadowing around the blade itself. But I think when all is said and done, you kind of take a seat, you look back on this fight, ten whole chapters. I think Kubo personally did right by these characters. Kyoraku gets, like, what, five or six chapters of being a total badass? And then he gets a few chapters of, like, some real deep introspection. And the now gets a chance to do something. And I think maybe Leia is the only real casualty here in that any semblance of his personality is almost completely erased by the time you get to his second form. And then he just gets completely ludicrous after that. But for the most part, I really, I think I really enjoy this battle between the leader of the Shinigami and the leader of the Schutzstoffel. I think Kubo's putting in a ton of work to bring us an epic battle here. And I'll be really interested to see how it translates to the anime and see if people like it a little better, see if they can maybe retroactively add a little more foreshadowing in somewhere. I wouldn't say no to that at all. Um, but that's it for this video. It's an extremely long one. I'm sorry about that. This is a super long and super in-depth and detailed fight that I want to talk a lot about. Like I said, these Schutzstoffel fights are very enjoyable. And I think there's a lot to say, a lot to dig into here. Even more than I mentioned, which is why I think I'm going to do a video on Kyoraku and the Now's pasts as well. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much, I think, everything I have to say on the matter. But that's it for this video, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you made it all the way to the end, I, I really appreciate it as well. Do let me know in the comments below what you thought of the battle between Kyoraku, Nanao, and Leah. Did you like it? Do you like it as much as I do? How do you feel about that controversial, polarizing ending regarding Nanao's super, super convenient, god-defeating blade? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. What did you think of Kyoraku's Bankai? And what did you think of Leah's Volstendig transformations? Really, this fight kind of has it all, which is why I feel like I, I can't be too hard on it. Like, I really love the atmosphere and everything like that. Um, this feels like a very feature-complete fight, I think is a good way of putting it, which is why I think I ultimately find it quite satisfying, even if there's some there are some elements that I would have slightly changed. But that's it for this video, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done already, and until next time, I'll catch you later. I'll see you then.